Welcome to the last installment. It took a little more time than I had planned to do this last section. I took a long look at this last portion and decided it needed an extra little touch. So I spent some time last week and beefed things up a little bit with some external information sources. Without further ado, let's get stuck in. You're almost there. This is the last section. In this final installment, we'll look at four other ways we can apply dimensionless numbers. Three potentially useful ones and one bad example. Why the bad example? Because we need to know the signs and know when to stop. It's also an important part of being thorough. The areas we'll touch on include evaluating our seasonal batch sales, comparing brew pub food success versus beer success, a front of house reward structure, and looking at a different sales incentive structure. The question that gets asked in a lot of small breweries that I've worked with is, is this seasonal batch worth it? There's times when brewers come up with recipes for seasonal beers that maybe aren't that economical. Maybe they only just barely scale to the full size system and, you know, they might be troublesome to make, they might be expensive to make, or sometimes it's hard to know if they're even selling well at all. And is it worth the activity of going through that extra branding, getting an extra label, all of those things. So in order to measure that, we're going to look at two things that brewers often don't track. And we're going to say days on tap, but this could be days in can. And it's how many days to sell out a seasonal batch. Or as well, we're going to compare it to our uh, flagship as well. So how long it takes out to sell a typical batch. And then we're also going to pull some seasonal traffic data from some government and industry groups. And that's information that's totally in the public domain. So just to give my clients a bit of privacy, I decided not to use the traffic data from anywhere where I've worked. I decided to use the traffic data from the highway intersection closest to my home. So I live in Ontario and our major highways are provincially managed. The government makes highway information available to the public at the following link. To demonstrate, I decided to pull up the information for the intersection not very far from my front door. And they have a handy table with the annual average daily traffic listed by year and location. And conveniently, it lists a summer and winter daily traffic volume as well. It even gives some information for weekday versus weekends. So I threw that data into Excel and graphed it here. The lighter colors show the summer traffic, which is significantly higher, and the darker lines show the winter daily traffic volumes. The two flat lines are the 22-year averages across the summer and winter figures. This is a very simple approximation. The summer traffic does show some year-by-year -year variation, but seems by and large stable over time. The winter traffic does seem to show a pattern of gradual increase in year-by-year -year volume, but for now we'll just keep things simple at a basic average. Comparing our figures, we see that the traffic was on average 52% higher in the summer and 28% lower than average in the winter across that 22-year period. This means that any business in my area that fronts on the highway would have 80% more exposure in summer than winter on average. No information is given for spring or autumn, so we'll assume that they are average, neither higher nor lower than typical, and we can weight our sales data with some real-life traffic volumes. We'll also simplify a season to be one quarter of a year, or exactly 91 and a quarter days. If we want to be technical, the length of each season isn't actually exactly equal because of the shape of the Earth's orbit, but it's not really that important for what we're studying here. I deliberately obscured some of my clients' real data so as to not overshare and give them a little bit of privacy. So the figures you see here for the production volumes and production costs are deliberately not accurate, but they are in the ballpark of real numbers. For our purposes today, we'll calculate a seasonal score in this fashion. We'll compare our days in the season to the days it takes to sell out a batch, the dollar per liter sale price of the product, and the dollar per liter ingredient cost of the product, as well as the seasonal batch volume and the typical batch volume. This means that a beer that sells out quickly will have a higher score. Basically, a popular beer will have a higher score. A beer that has high losses or pricey ingredients will have a lower score. And these are all things that small brewers are very interested in. Seasonal batches don't really work when they're not in season. And, you know, brewing it three times in a season is great, so long as all of those batches actually sell out. Likewise, it includes stuff that is of paramount importance to the brewer, i.e. the sale price and the ingredient cost. The comparison of the two batch volumes also gives a little bit of a feel for how difficult the product is to make. Typically, anything that has very, very high losses is also going to be a bit of a pain in the ass to do. So taking our sample figures here, we see some fairly typical scenarios. We see summer and spring seasonals being a bit more popular and selling out a bit more quickly. 
we have some products that are having high losses, some that are being expensive to make because of the ingredients, and some that are indeed sitting around on tap for a fairly long time. We also have our flagship ale uh, slotted in at the bottom. It's listed for being on tap for the entire season because of course it is. Its batch volume is of a typical size and its uh, ingredient costs are, are listed there as well. The big spike in this table we see is the spring seasonal pint, and that's because, you know, in this scenario, we decided we weren't doing small samplers of the spring seasonal for whatever reason, possibly because it was running out of tap too quickly. We have a reasonable size batch volume compared to our reference. Our ingredient cost is actually fairly low as well, and our sale price is, of course, higher than our reference. So all put together, it gives it actually a very high score. And these are those same figures plotted in the chart, and we see the same pattern that I was mentioning earlier. We haven't yet accounted for the traffic volumes that I gathered from that government table. This is where we introduce a traffic adjusted seasonal score. Let's pretend the brewery that I gathered the information from is very near to my home and use the traffic data that we've already gathered. We can now define a seasonal boost factor, plus 52% for summer, minus 28% for winter, and 0% for spring and autumn. Our traffic adjusted seasonal score then becomes this. It's our seasonal score divided by one plus our seasonal boost factor. I've also written out the full equation if you like to skip steps. When we graph those adjusted figures, we see that suddenly things like the winter seasonal that looked like it was performing poorly don't seem so bad after all. We also see that the spring seasonal still is actually performing very well, and we notice that our fall seasonal rather than being on par with our winter seasonal, is actually perhaps a point of concern. It's sitting around for a bit too long, and maybe the beer simply isn't that good and is still expensive to make. Now that we've looked at our seasonal batch, let's take a step back and look at our brew pub as a whole. Measuring the performance of a brew pub can be important if, for one thing, you own more than one brew pub and you want to know how well they're doing compared to each other, but it also might come in handy if you ever have to buy or sell a brew pub comparing your brew pub to a brew pub in a similar location to find out how relatively well the business is doing could become critical. Some might be familiar with looking at dollars per square foot to evaluate a business. This is a common way to evaluate space efficiency in many, many businesses, even though we really should be using square meters. This approach looks at the revenue earned from beer sales versus revenue from food and entertainment to evaluate where a business should focus its energies or investments. You know, we're making this much dollars per square foot on the brewery versus we're making this much dollars per square foot on the restaurant. Ergo, the brewery is performing better than the restaurant in terms of money in. This is the metric I would propose in addition to the dollar per square foot measure that's already in use. Measuring the dollars per square foot is actually a really important way to compare a retail business. But if we want to know how good is the beer for this brewery, we need to go one step further. By putting the revenues in areas as percentages of a whole, we can take a look at the beer and food performance in a given location, whether or not that location is doing well. If the town around a brewery goes through a population boom, beer sales are likely to increase whether or not the brewery is actually being well run. Likewise, if an area sort of dies, then a dip in dollars per square foot may have absolutely nothing to do with the brewer's latest offerings. This way we're looking at customers who have already entered the business and how they're spending their money without worrying too much about how many customers are actually entering the business. Both are very important, but they are in some ways separate problems. By weighting the money spent on a given activity against the total revenue generated, we're actually allowing things like the relative pricing of different items that are competing against each other affect their performance score. This is a more honest way of tracking how customers actually prefer to spend their cash. With this score, a relatively tiny brewery footprint that sells a relatively large beer revenue would score very well, and an expansive restaurant that doesn't sell much food would score poorly. We can even extend this to any aspect of a business we want, like say retail or entertainment value. Things like pool tables, arcade games, that sort of thing. Now in order for a brew pub to be a brew pub at all, it needs the restaurant and the brewery anyway. Neither is going to exist in isolation. However, we can inform our planning and perhaps evaluate the success of past decisions using things like these scores. Do people even come here for the food? Is it worth 
trying to justify a new pizza oven? Can we justify a new bright beer tank? Or is the brewery already performing very well? And are there other needier areas of our business? You know, have we wasted a bunch of space on a pool table that's not really providing the ambiance we want, that's not bringing us in any money, and maybe isn't driving any other sales? Scores like these inform our choices more, but they're not ever useful totally in isolation. There's nothing in this equation for budget or legal requirement. However, in reality, our businesses are constrained by things like these legalities and technicalities like, do we have enough money and is this legal? Now we'll check in with the front of house and see if we can apply ourselves there. Here we'll see an example where using a dimensionless number without doing a reality check might be a very bad idea. Managing a front of house involves balancing ingredient cost, labor availability, with pricing, specialty sales, and always ensuring an appropriate atmosphere. Let's suppose you're managing a front of house and you want to motivate higher revenue sales rather than higher volume sales. You could look at how servers perform relative to what they are selling as well as how much of what they are selling. Beer or wine, for instance, can vary widely in purchase price, but are dispensed rather than prepared. There's much less labor involved. Cocktails, however, have fewer expectations when it comes to price point, but fancy cocktails in particular can vary widely in makeup, markup, and price. If we were trying to be clever, we could make this server tip boost score that would compare the revenue of the beverage products sold from the revenue of the bar shift total. This would give you a metric for how well each server was doing in terms of actually pushing your product, and it would be relatively simple to calculate. We would take the point of sale data for the total products sold by a server against a pre-calculated table of drink revenues to calculate this score. The bar manager might provide some kind of monetary extra to the highest score, or they could have some kind of multiplier on everyone's tips that would actually scale with the score. Someone might try to do this to, instead of dividing the tips evenly between all the servers, to try to reward servers that are selling the highest revenue products. But if we were to engage in this scenario, if a server were to encourage an atmosphere where lots of drinks are sold, but not necessarily at their own table, they would drive their own score down. Likewise, a server who promoted cocktails that were expensive to produce might not perform as well as a server who promoted simple and cheap drinks, and those are two very, very different ambiances to have in a business that might have a specific goal in mind. Scaling servers' tips to this score would actually pit servers against each other. In the wrong business culture, this will lead to some pretty petty sabotage, and it's not necessarily the atmosphere you want to generate. What we would rather is the servers are sort of working together as a team to ensure that there's a high-quality environment and everyone's supported in their roles. And likewise, tipping this way would encourage no one to clean the vomit out of the urinals, but, you know, somebody's got to deal with that problem before it gets stinky. While we could use the server tip boost score to try to increase revenue or try to be more fair somehow, doing so would be incredibly short-sighted and indeed a bad idea. And so ends our negative example. If you've ever shopped for beer in rural and remote Canada, you'll know that unless there's a little local brewery, the selection will probably suck. It's not just because selling to far flung places isn't very attractive to the brewer. It's also because even investigating the opportunity isn't very attractive to the sales rep. The way we motivate our sales reps to go out and sell beer is often tied to an incentive structure that prioritizes quick, large deliveries as close to the brewery as possible. While an excellent way to make the most out of limited distribution networks, it leaves our rural customers, some of whom grow our ingredients, entirely out in the cold. Medium and large sized breweries with greater reach actually have the capacity to serve some of these areas, but they never will unless the incentive is good enough for the sales rep to actually make the trip and show up. Here's one example of a performance score we could use to measure how well a regional sales or distribution rep is doing. We'll call this an incentive boost. It looks at their dollar sales for the dollar spent in fuel divided by the average region sales area, which is again divided by their own sales region area. This score would reward two scenarios, fuel efficient delivery routes with high sales and would compensate reps that have relatively large sales regions. We're still not going to hit up every small little mom and pop shop in the way to some place, but at least we have some way to be a little bit more fair to reps that have absolutely massive areas, which in Canada is very much the reality for remote sales routes. We still have to keep in mind, though, how much we're spending on fuel to get to these places and how that might affect things like our price. So it's important to keep our fuel term in there. 
I would argue that trying to improve the reward structure for sales reps in this fashion might improve the beer choice in rural Canada, which I'm certain we'd all be grateful for. I hope these last few examples have helped clarify the concept of dimensionless numbers and show you how they are developed and calculated. I hope you now have the tools you need to think, consider, and develop your own, or even modify the ones that I've provided. The key takeaway is that the most useful dimensionless numbers are made with a sage understanding of real-world influences and are often continually tuned and weighted by experimental data. It doesn't matter if we collect extra information if that information has absolutely nothing to do with what we're looking at. It's only when these factors interact that measuring them together becomes important or even useful. Use dimensionless numbers to show patterns and inform decisions, but always ground yourself in reality. Take a step back and look at the big picture. It's very important to stop and verify that the results we've produced actually match the reality we expect to find. Basically, the dimensionless number shouldn't upset the apple cart, but it'll hopefully explain some mysteries that you couldn't otherwise solve. If you've made it to the end of this video, congratulations! I suspect you're in good company, but few. I hope you found this helpful in understanding the concept of dimensionless numbers, and have seen several ways they might be used to make breweries better. I doubt you've watched this far just to disagree, but if you have, I'd love to continue improving my ideas, so please reach out. Together, we can make math make beer better.